I am truly honored to have been asked to speak to such an august audience and to be part of this panel of explorers. I have been humbled and astonished at the reception of my book, My Travels in West Africa, and I am happy to answer some of the questions that have arisen, and I want to thank you all for submitting those questions in writing as you arrived so that I could attempt to make this coherent in the time allotted to me. I don't wish to intrude on the other speaker's time. So, there were a number of people who asked, why on earth did I decide to go alone to an uncharted, <coughs> unexplored part of the globe? Well, I have to lay that at my father's feet. He was a physician, and he would travel around with nobles as they went around the globe, whether they were uh, hunting American bison or dodo birds or African elephants or Indian tigers, and he would go along on these expeditions in case uh, medical help was needed. And he had some amazing adventures, and he would write these truly exciting letters back. And his library was filled with nothing but travelogues and uh, maps and, and that sort of thing. And that was the only education I ever had available to me. And so when my familial duties were over and both of my parents had passed on, I decided to treat myself to a trip to the Canary Islands. And while I was there, I met a number of riverboat captains who were trading up and down the west coast of West, west Africa, and they had some wondrous tales to tell, and I decided that I would like to see this for myself. But I had limited financial means and so I approached the uh, Natural History Museum and came to an agreement with them that I would collect specimens of fish and insects to bring back for their collection in exchange for uh, a little monetary contribution. Um, another question was why did I not hire native porters to transport me instead of canoeing through mangrove swamps, climbing up ravines, and crossing rivers on foot. Well, hiring porters to carry one across uh, or up and down the continent of Africa is very expensive, and I am a person of modest means. In addition to that, I felt that I would get to know the people better if I ate what the natives ate, and I slept at, in the natives' cabins, and this would engender some trust. And then I could ask some questions about their culture that I might not be able to, to get if I came the other way. Because historically, those people being harried by porters treated the natives terribly. And missionaries were not appreciated. Well, the next two questions I received were sort of related. Um, did I really dress in skirts, blouses, and boots in that horribly hot weather? Had women dressing in men's pants have been more suitable? I would never appear in public in something that I would not feel decent enough to be in Piccadilly Circus. And that doesn't matter to me whether it is West Africa or London. But I will tell you that my skirt and my bustle saved my life. One of the trips that we were on, I had two fan guides and two of the regular guides that I had, and we were walking along a trail from one area to another, and the fan guides, they were tall and thin and really long legs, and they would just down that trail, and myself and the other two guides who would sort of plod along. And then they would get tired, and they would sit down, and we would catch up with them, and we'd have something to eat and drink, and then I would get up and start down the road, and when the fan guides were ready, they would 
you know, get up and the next thing you know, they've passed me and we're on down the road. Well, in this particular instance, um, they were all having something to eat and drink and talk. And I proceeded ahead. Now you have to understand that these trails are in jungles. And a lot of them are basically game trails. And so sometimes, yeah, you know, they're not easy to follow. And I was going along, and I came to this one area that was sort of cleared off of underbrush, but there was a huge pile of dead bracken, etc. And I could either go through this marshy jungle area, or I decided I would lift up my skirts and I would cross over the dried branches and bracken that was in the way. I took about two steps onto the bracken and I fell 10 feet into a game pit. In the bottom of that game pit, there were nine ebony spears. And my bustle caught one and my skirts caught several others and I was suspended. Had I been wearing men's pants, I would have been skewered for sure. <laughs> I yelled, uh, and eventually the guys caught up with this, and uh, the one I referred to as Duke looked down and said, you killed? <laughs> and I said, no, go get a bush rope and get me out of here. He took forever, and I was looking at how I could get myself out, but they are, they go in like this, and it was like a yellowy uh, clay, and it sloped, and there was no way I would have been able to get out of there myself. Eventually, they found the perfect size bush rope for wrapping around an English lady and pulling her out. Um, another question, oh, the skirts, however, are no help whatsoever with the insects. They will still climb off your legs. It doesn't, there, there are no help whatsoever in that area. What was the most frightening thing that I had to endure? Well, all of the rivers in Africa, on either coast, they flow out from the center to either coast. And at the mouth of every one of those rivers are mangrove swamps. Thousands of gallons of water come through those mangrove <coughs> swamps every year. Now, if you were on a steamboat on the river and you pass a crocodile swimming along or sunning itself on the bank with its mouth open, you can sketch or take a picture of it and send it to your relatives and they can all be frightened on your behalf. However, if you were in a canoe in a mangrove swamp, you worry that you, you get to be afraid for yourself, and you worry that no one is going to know what happened to you. Um, I took a canoe into a mangrove swamp to get some fish samples, and uh, although I was good at paddling, I was not as good at noticing that the tidal river uh, had started to drain, and I was in a particularly deep lagoon and by the time I realized I could not get the canoe out to the river. So I decided to sit in the canoe and looked as if this was just where I wanted to be. And I tried to project both the crocodiles and the mangrove swamps that this was perfectly normal. Um, and the crocodiles, however, were all awake because the tide was coming in. And that's when the fish come in and they make it their business to be awake when the fish are coming. So I sat there and I looked around and uh, the choices were you couldn't drive the canoe because it, it was surrounded by mud. And, and if I went into the mud near the canoe, it was like quicksand and I would probably have gone down in five to ten minutes. And, you know, in 2,000 years, uh, when it wasn't a mangrove swamp anymore, some, you know, archaeologists would find me 
and uh, make a big fuss about it. I'd get written up in the newspaper, but this was not what I had in mind. If I truly, or if you find yourself in that situation, and you really want to be taken care of for all posterity, you would jump into the black, stinky slime, because it will preserve you perfectly. And when they <laughs> find you, they will put you in a museum. <laughs> Neither of those um, appealed to me. So I sat in the canoe and just tried to act like this was normal until one of the crocodiles decided he wanted to make my acquaintance. And he came over the uh, end of the canoe. So I took my paddle and I stood up and I backed up and I bashed him right across the mouth. He left the canoe and I then had it to a deeper place and I stayed all night in that stinking swamp thinking about what had possessed me to come to Western Africa and after having done that did I really need to build a lily and go into a mangrove swamp? But I survived. Um, that crocodile was about eight feet long. He was only like a teenage crocodile. I did not measure him, at least don't tell anyone that I measured him because I did not, but other people who had captured or killed crocodiles that I did measure, they sometimes go up to 15 feet. So he was obviously a young adult crocodile. Uh, another question was, what was the most beautiful sight that I saw in my travels? I would say the Ogami River. A trip down that river has got to be one of the most beautiful scenes on this planet. The redwood trees stretch out like they are an endless temple. The papyrus in flower is just lacy. The roar and the tumbling of the river over the rocks, it was like a Beethoven symphony. And at night, all you could hear the strange birds, the sound of the river, and millions and millions of stars. So my last question of the evening is, uh, do I have any words of wisdom for anyone considering visiting West Africa? Well, since there's so many women here in the audience, and I would like to address a single woman uh, traveling, in particular, after all, that's where my experience lies. You must constantly be prepared for the question regarding your husband. Where is your husband? Where did you leave your husband? <laughs> uh, I would recommend that it is best to say that you are searching for him and that you wish to go in whatever direction it is you're trying to travel. And they will be most accommodating to help you. I'd like to note that neither the Royal Geographic Society's list, their hints for travelers, nor Silver's uh, what to pack for a tropical trip, neither of them mention husbands. So be persistent, <laughs> like myself, and you will be able to explore. I am afraid I am out of time. Um, after this, uh, when we are done, I will autograph copies of my book in the lock.